Hello, friends and enemies, heroes and villains. Welcome to Epic Realms. Today's guest is a singer, songwriter, and New York Times bestselling author. His novel, The Bird Box, has inspired more than one film, and his new book, Spin a Black Yarn, is out August 15th. Please welcome Josh Mallerman to Epic Realms. Thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate you being here. Yeah, this is awesome. I'm glad to be here. Hello, hello, everybody. So I read that you've had multiple books written long before you even had your first one published. Was that like a challenge for you? Was that difficult uh, to try and like get one out there? Or was it just that you, you know, you had them and you were doing them because you wanted to do them and you knew one day they'd get published? That was maybe like one of the most electrifying periods of my life. I was just, you know, I'm already playing in the band. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm on the road with my best friends, bandmates. And um, I had been trying to write novels for about 10 years be before I finished the first one. And I finally had a breakthrough, finished the first one. And then they just kept coming every like six months, probably an average of that. And, you know, we were touring the country, playing a different city every night, drinking, la, la, la. And so there was no, what's the right phrase? There was no sense of like that anything needed to change from that. So writing the novels wasn't like a hobby. But I also didn't see it as like some uh, desperation or something um, yeah. or as like with dollar signs on my eyes or anything like that. It was very like, hey, let's write another one. You know, now it's been a few months. Let's write another one. And that number got up to something like, yeah, it was something like 14 or something before Bird Box came out. Bird Box was the fourth book that I wrote. Awesome. How did that how did that come across when you when you decided to publish or you decided to go through it, did, did you have somebody that were like, Hey, let me help you out with this. Or, or what yeah. was that process like to get signed and get published? Did it, did it, was it a signed book or did you self publish? No, that's exactly what happened. Um, you know, again, our band was like touring like crazy, but don't get the wrong idea. We were playing for like 20 people a night, but right. we were playing like 200 something shows a year. It was, it was absolutely electrifying writing novels in the passenger seat, writing novels in bars, writing novels at coffee shops at home when we were at home. And somewhere along the way, um, a friend of mine from high school who like knew a lawyer in Los Angeles, knew of a lawyer in Los Angeles, you know, worked with him. Uh, and my friend was like, hey, you're posting that you're finishing another novel. It seems like every month, like, can I, let me send my friend one. And I did, I sent him one uh, called Goblin, which has been, which has been published now. And the lawyer called me. He's like, hey, this is great. I'd like to represent you. And I think that I have a manager in mind for you. And I was like, what is going on? You know, again, I'm like a dozen novels deep at yeah. this point. The band, you know, I'm living in my friend's, you know, extra bedroom, whatever. And the manager turned out to be like, um, he, we're still together now, like 14 years later or something. We talk all the time, obviously. Um, and he and I rewrote like with his tutelage i rewrote a book of mine called unburied carol for about 18 months and then we were about to shop unburied carol and i was like you know what Let's, maybe we should do this one instead and i and i had i had bird box already written and it just it just sort of unburied carol is like a western and i was a little nervous about it being like the first story to be like a western that, it, yeah. that i could be mistaken as a western author or something i don't right. really know you now i don't think i into one little corner but now I don't think that anyone's even shoehorned. So I don't know what I, you know, maybe it was a little different eight years ago. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, I, and I, we worked on Bird Box for another 18 months. So there was three years now of me working with this, with this new manager guy. And we then sent it to an agent who shopped at the Harper Collins and it got picked up. Awesome. Was that exciting for you that day that they're like, we're going to do this? Oh my God. Yeah. It was crazy because up until then, kind of like you you intimated a moment ago, there was kind of this like blind sense of one day these will end up on the shelves. I don't, I don't know if it was like, I don't know if it's a matter of confidence or if it's a matter of, you know, I'm reading horror novels and I'm reading, I'm writing my own and, or it's just this sense of like believing in the work that you're doing and the work that I was doing and just believing like, yeah, you know, if them, why not me? Why not? Not, you know, they're no better, they're no worse, I'm no better, I'm no worse, why not me? That right. kind of feeling. And so there was a sense the whole time of like, these will end up on the shelf. I do not know how that's going to happen. And I didn't even really try to do that. But keep in mind, 
I was like, like again, uh, on the road with the band, like every single day and booking our shows and playing shows and writing novels and this. So it wasn't like I'm sitting at home, like one day this will work out for me. You know, <laughs> It was more like, just keep going, keep going. Whatever you're doing is good. And this is going to work out one day. Yeah. How did you come across like the want to write? Did you, were you a writer in like high school and or college or anything like that and doing a lot of writing or was it oh, just yeah. like, like I from, write the start, from like, from like fifth grade. I mean, I remember it was like a Hanukkah present or something. My parents got me like a, a children's book or something a little, little above that. And I remember um, I opened the present and stood up and read the book cover to cover to them. And I remember they're like, Oh, Josh, and they were like clapping and stuff. And sometimes I attribute all of this to that moment that like right away, I was so excited about this book and read it all to them and then got the encouragement from them that this was a good thing. And then, and then we had a thing called Pine Tree Books here in Michigan, where it was like a competition, like you had to do book reports for every book you read and whoever read the most books, you know, so at the end of the year, it would be me and these, like these two girls, you know, would always end up being like at the end, end of the year, yeah. in, like elementary school, then tried kind of writing my own stories and and so forth. So it's always been there. The real sort of push came at around age 19, where it's like, all right, you know, let's try to write a novel. But it took about 10 years before I was able to actually figure out how that was done. I, I, I tried to write four other ones in that decade. Mm -hmm. And I, I just didn't know how to finish them. I didn't understand what I was doing. Like, it felt like I was just meandering. It felt like I was, now it just seems like, because I actually have all those unfinished ones, you know? I mean, literally, I just, I can open it and be like, dude, why don't you just like go here and here and here and then it's the end and blah. It's so, it, it's so obvious to me where those should have gone now. But at the time it was, it was so daunting. Yeah. So about age 29, finished the first one. And now, now the other day, I just finished my 38th. That's amazing. Have you ever thought about going back to some of those other ones where you're like, this would be easier and be like, I want to redo this. Cause if it stands yeah. out to you that easily, it's like, I'm just going to do it now. Yeah. Because, okay. So there's one that I was seeing, I was seeing about recently. So it's called George Wax, Man of Wax. Right. And it's four novellas. And each one is like an account of George told by like a best friend, a girlfriend, um, a nurse, um, something like that was taking care of him. Um, uh, so I can't remember the fourth one right now. And each account was like wildly disparaging. The first account was this guy sounds like the greatest dude on earth. <laughs> and then the second novella, you're like, uh oh, and you start to realize now nah, George had some, some messed up stuff about him. And then the third one, I, I can't remember the fourth one, when the nurse is taking care of him, you kind of get the truth or maybe because George is like telling the nurse, you know, some like stuff, some heavy stuff as he's like about to pass or something. So that one, I still love that idea. And I think that that, that that concept of four novellas that are just four contradictory descriptions of the same character, that's a lot of fun. Yeah. Is that yeah. kind of an idea? And I, I, we'll get to it here in a little bit, but is that, it's kind of a short question. Is that kind of what the new spinny yarns kind of like? Are they a little bit different? No. You mean spin a black yarn? The, spin a the black book? yarn, yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. That's just five, like, totally different um, stories. Okay. Like, unrelated. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, and we'll definitely, and guys, people that are listening, we're definitely going to get to that. Uh, that's why why we're here, why we're here today. You mentioned your music and doing some music, and I would be remiss if I didn't bring up the music, the singer-songwriter, some of the music, uh, which, you know, I, I spent a couple of days listening to on Spotify uh, and really enjoyed. What is... What is kind of the difference between writing some of those songs and but and then going and writing these stories? Is there a connection between how the process is or is there a difference? You know, for a long time, the smaller ideas were became songs and the longer ideas became books. So if it was a big or a big idea it became a book and then and, and if it was kind of like a Twilight Zone scenario, I could turn that into a small song or something. And then I started writing short stories. You know, I, I had written something like 14 novels before I really started trying to write short stories. And I was worried. And there was a period where I didn't write many songs because those smaller ideas in scope became stories. Right. <laughs> but the biggest link that I can find between the two is the rhythm of it, is the beat of it, is, you know, the rough drafts for me are like real fiery experiences, real like... 
and we're going and we're going and anything goes. And if, if this sucks, don't worry about it. We'll fix it later. And, and the rough drafts, you know, bird box was written in 26 days. Wow. Um, and it was just, yeah. And, it, and the book was almost twice as long. The rough draft was almost twice as long as what, what ended up being published. So, I mean, we're talking like 4,000, 4,300 words a day, just go, 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 go. And I think it makes sense because in the band, I kind of play like rhythm guitar. Okay. And I, for a long time, our bass player was sort of like our lead, but on bass. So I'm very used to like, I stay home with the drums. Mm, 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 mm. And then I think that Bird Box plays out that way. I think that Daphne plays out that way. I think all the novels have sort of like a drummer to them. And to me, that's the biggest link that I've been able to find is the rhythm of, of music and the rhythm of writing a novel. Well, and I was going to ask you about that because all of your all of your books seem to definitely have this rhythm and tone, especially Bird Box. There's like, I feel like the pacing of that story brings this, just the pacing brings a little bit of dread and a little bit of that, that, that suspense to it just based on you know how things are patterned out and paced out and i was wondering if that had might have had something to do with your music background as well so there you go you know at some point while writing that book it started to feel like and this was in a good way to me that, that you could play one note through every scene like one yeah yeah and it did not change the, the mood just kept following this one this one ominous note or something it almost felt like if you had added even one one other note, even even if it was a minor or an ugly half step down, whatever it is, it seemed like if you added anything to that, you would lose what was already there. And so, definitely, I was thinking the way you're you're talking right now. Yeah, nice. What is your process? You said that that book was you know was really huge, and then you whittled it down by half. Do you have a process? Is it kind of like a fly by the seat of your pants? You have an idea and just go with it? Do you kind of come up with an outline? You know, a beginning, middle, end? What is kind of your process for putting that stuff down? No, definitely um, fly by the seat of my pants, but with landmark scenes in mind, you know? Okay. Like when the idea comes, well, most most of the time, when the idea and the ideas come, it'll be like, oh, there's this. And then, like, you know that down the road this happens, and Maybe you even know how it ends or whatever, but you got to get from here to there and here to there. A lot of the time, it seems like readers' favorite stuff is the getting from here to there, not those landmark scenes that you were so excited to right. get on paper. You know, it's very interesting um, because people be like, oh, I love that scene when they, when they met in the grocery store. And you're like, that's the scene you loved? Okay, all right, right on, you know? And it's like the smallest little moment or something. But there was one book that I did outline uh, i i mean i guess there's been a few now but for a while there was only really one and that was because it was such a big book yeah that i was it was like a thousand pages and i was worried of like making it to like 700 pages into this arc and then being stuck and not having any ideas so i had this sort of list of and then this happens and then this happens and this happens it wasn't really like a like a plot outline it wasn't like um like agatha christie I imagine that she has to really plot her, her <laughs> yeah. stories. This wasn't, this is an outline. This is, don't think that way. This was more like a pantser saying, okay, and then they meet this woman. Okay. And then they go yeah. to this bar and then you know, it was more like that. Yeah. Nice. Have you seen that your, your, your style or your process, not your style, but has your process changed over the course of years and kind of what, if it has, what do you think has changed? No, it really hasn't. And, and it's something that, you know, maybe i would benefit from it maybe i should try that i've tried things differently like um i tried writing only 500 words a day for a whole novel and i did it i i tried 5300 words for a day for a novel i tried at night i've tried in the morning i've tried um i've done so i've done a million different things freehand typewriter computer um but i think for me in terms of like when i think of the process I think about every six months or about twice a year, I'm like, hey, man, that next idea, let's get to that next idea. Whether it's, it, it, how about this? It typically doesn't follow the process of the former novel or the last novel, but it will follow its own meaning. So if I start that book at like 8 a.m. on a Monday or something and I write till noon, the next day, probably I'll start at 8 a.m. till noon, that book becomes, oh, this is a morning book. Or, oh, this is an afternoon book. Or, oh, you're only doing 
1500 words a day with this one interesting or or no you're 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 crazy going for 4500 a day so it's they they each seem to be consistent within themselves but no overarching uh routine that i follow okay i mentioned i did a little slip and i talked a little bit about style and i know there was a uh, a chat you had with somebody at some point and you had mentioned some of your inspirations uh, as far as movies go, that you thought maybe things like like Twilight Zone or like Creep Show might have had an effect on some of the different books and the variations of theme on that. Um, and so my question is: is were there other inspirations that you had into the genre, you know, besides those type of things that we might also kind of recognize looking back? Well, you know, so I had read like I was reared on horror novels, like a lot of us are and were and then i had this period where you know i went to school i went to michigan state i uh, went there for like an english degree and i barely graduated i was already trying to write these novels and you know once we graduated me and my songwriting partner mark we were like hey let's actually go back and read all the books we were supposed to read in college but we didn't read you know let's okay yeah, we yeah. now and we have the band and we're like we should read these you know so we kind of went on this like bender, this classics bender. And, and I was reading Faulkner, Fitzgerald, Virginia Woolf, uh, Proust, Hemingway. I mean, just Gertrude Stein, just go, 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 go. And it was amazing. I mean, everything we picked up, we couldn't stop talking to each other about all this stuff. And it was incredible. While sort of picking off the classics, it led me to Dracula. And I was like, oh yeah, you know, it, it was kind of like a reminder or something that you could you could write in genre and also shoot for like go write a classic. You right. could write in genre and, and 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 absolutely transcend the genre at the same time. So I don't know if it's influenced me directly. I would I don't know if I write like Bram Stoker, but it spiritually that book really did something for me because it was like, oh hey man, you know all that shit that you love. Now that we went and like read all these like giant classics and what a what a trip that was. Now let's go back to the genre. Now and you know, now let's write horror stories and like see what comes from this. So Dracula was a major signpost for me. Yeah. Were there uh you, you mentioned like books and Dracula? Were there any TV shows or movies you really like? Do you do you like other horror movies? I saw somebody somewhere you said something about the the new the movie uh paranormal being being pretty cool i don't remember exactly what you had said you mentioned something about paranormal and i was like i wonder what other movies and tv shows he's a fan of oh yeah yeah uh i mean you know but it's so wide i don't even know where to begin because i love the you know uh what's the right word for that the gore as much as i love the like sort of more quiet yeah i like the super intelligent the intentionally dumb i, I love it all you know <laughs> okay. and, and and, and and where it works in and of itself, you know, I mean, you can find, that's kind of the thing about, I think probably any genre, but horror seems particularly like this, where like you could be searching, you know, if I gave you a hundred VHS tapes from the eighties and you had right. heard of like a handful of them and you're going to be sifting through somewhere, you're like, oh boy, this one, oh boy, this one, oh, <laughs> God, I don't know about this one. But then when you do find one, you're like, oh. And, it, and it's like, that's like the whole love of the genre yeah. is that you can sift through and you're still excited to sift through the stuff you didn't love. You're still excited that you saw it. And, but then when you find like that, that sort of gem in there and that happens and that happened for me like all the time, you know? Um, I mean, but now it seems like nowadays everyone knows what, and there is no obscure anymore because all the, all these gems are all in streaming services or whatever. Right. But there was a period of time where you really, you just kind of put in a VHS tape and kind of hoped. Yeah, you go down to the local no video reviews. vision and try and find out what you're... <laughs> yeah, there were no reviews online or anything. You're right. Kind of like, well, maybe, this, maybe this is good. Yeah. yeah. What uh, Do you watch any of the, like, the modern, like, I don't know, reality paranormal shows, the Ghost Adventures, Holzer Files, stuff like that? Um, Have you seen that one, Hellier? I've heard of it. Great. It's great. Um, But beyond that, I haven't... I haven't watched that much of that kind of thing, but sometimes like, you know, not, not for any reason or something. I just, I would like to actually watch more of it now that you brought it up. I don't know. You know? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Fair enough. How do you choose 
uh, where you're going in 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 the feel for a book, like um, like the the what is it, the black black mad wheel? Yeah, has a little bit different. You know, one one's you know bird box is very visually and black mad wheel isn't visual it's more like audible how do you how do you choose how that's going to be like was that an intentional like i want to do something with these different senses and and how that's going to play with it or no, that's, it a, just... that's, a, that's a good question but no and and this is this is sort of um not that there's a downside but sort of the 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 tricky side of having written now 38 novels and having having had that backlog when Bird Box came out, right? Right. Because Black Man Wheel, I think, is the Bird Box is the fourth book I wrote. Black Man Wheel is the twentieth. For whatever reason, those two are one and two in publication, so it could seem like this guy was dealing with senses, yeah. sight, sound. But I mean, there were sixteen or eighteen other novels that had nothing to do with senses at all. Right. Right. It just happened to be the first two to roll out. So. No, definitely wasn't thinking in those terms. By the time I wrote Black Man Wheel, I was in a whole different place than than where I when I wrote Bird Box, you know. Yeah. But obviously, obviously, I was aware when Black Man Wheel was coming out that this is following a book about sight, and yeah. this one's about sound. Yeah, I was aware of it. Obviously, okay, okay. Uh, let's talk about the new book, shall we? Yeah. So, this new book—it's an anthology of novellas right basically mm -hmm. um how did this come about was it just like i have all these novellas these sh not necessarily short stories obviously that you wanted to put out there and let's put them together in a book or how did that come about did they come to you and say we want you to do a do something else and you're like well this is what i've got no i don't i don't really operate that way and i don't i don't mean that in a punkish way like they don't tell me what to do right, but, right. but but I, I don't really operate that way. It's not like that. It, it's it's like um I had written so the last story is the longest one. It's called Igarov, and it's, okay. it's it's big. I mean, it's pretty much novel length. And I had written that, and then a couple of years later, I had a, a list of ideas that were smaller ideas, and I thought it'd be fun to write them all in a row, right? So I wrote you know the at five like novellas, whatever, right? And like all in a row. And then when I turned that into the editor, the editor said to me, hey, this first one could be your next novel. And then the other four are Spin a Black Yarn. That'll be your collection. But let's turn this first one into a novel. And I was like, whoa, okay. So I did. That, that one's Daphne. Okay. And, and so that left four stories, but I felt like the book was now missing that fifth story so that book that i had written a couple of years before i squashed down a bit and added that to it so it, it was definitely like intentionally seeking out um writing a collection rather than having written them over the years and then collected them yeah it was, it was like intentional let's sit down and write a collection i love the name of the book spin a black yarn it's like really easy it's it's not a super short name but it's super easy to remember anybody that knows the the people spinning yarn sort of thing uh was that was that you that came up with that did somebody else help you with that did yeah, somebody no, mention it in the background actually, you're like that's a great name no that 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 has been so in 2000 i think 11 i wrote a collection of novellas called spin a black yarn okay then those novellas each ended up in different places one became a novel one was published over here one was published over there so that they you know spin a black yarn dissipated one of them was published as a Kindle single, and I needed to give the myself a publisher name. You're supposed to do that when you publish on there. So I was like, uh, Spin a Black Yarn Press. Okay. okay. But then my agent was like, that's too good of a title to just throw as like some imaginary yeah. press on yeah. Kindle. So my manager and I, after Bird Box, the movie and all this, we were like, hey, we started a production company where we are producers on my stuff and like other writers as well, you know, we're trying and this is what we're trying to do. And we needed a name for our company. And Ryan was like, what about Spin a Black Yarn? That title is still still there. And I was like, oh yeah, right. So it started as a book, then became this pretend thing. 
than our actual company, which is still called that. But I still wanted it to, I still wanted to name a book that. I still, I was, I was like, no, I, you know what? I'm glad we call ourselves this, but I still want a book. Yeah. So when I sat down to write that new collection of novellas, I was like, okay, this is, this is Spin a Black Yarn. This is it. So if you do more later, it will be like spin another black yarn. Sp- yeah, I don't know. Spin, spin don't a know. longer, you know. You know what's weird? You know what's if you do more? Spin a longer. <laughs> you know what's weird is like, what's the right phrase? Like, I kind of want to just do that again right now. Another like collection. But it's very strange to like, for me at least, you know, Goblin is a, is a collection of novellas. That was, man, that was like 2005 or something. Yeah. So they don't come that often, right? It's 2005, 2011, 2021 or something. But I'm kind of like hankering to do another one of that. It was so fun to do that I kind of want to do another one. And I don't know what that looks like yet. Okay. So what is, what is, what do you say? Ag- Igorov? Agarov? Igorov, yeah. Igorov. What's, what's this, what's kind of the, the basis of the story there? So Igorov is about this old, rotten man who murders a guy in the street he doesn't realize that he just murdered a triplet one of three and the two remaining brothers the two surviving brothers they stage sort of a faux haunting to the old man pretending to be the ghost of the man he killed oh so the old man will wake up and see the guy he killed in the street in his bedroom and "Ah," you know run downstairs and there he is again right because there's two of them right so that is essentially like a revenge story of the two surviving triplets on, on the guy that murdered their third. That feels like that could be very Edgar Allan Poe-ish. Obviously, I don't know how it reads or how it paces, but it very sounds like something really like of that feel where it's like this revenge, we're going to get you sort of thing, horror uh, uh, feel to it. So I'm excited for that. Yeah. Um, what are some of the other stories in the book? You've got I, I've got a list here in front of me: the house that is haunted, Argyle, the Jupiter Drop, Doug and Judy by the house washer. What's you want to you want to pick one of those out and kind of tell us a little bit about? Oh it? yeah, sure. Um, you know, Allison and I when we bought like or we moved into sort of like our first house, um, it was like the you know I never like rented a house like on my own or anything like that in my okay. life. I was living in friends' bed, extra bedrooms and shit. I was just walking around like, wow, all this space for just us, you know? <laughs> and then I started imagining like, wouldn't it like, and then I started thinking like, oh, we got to like clean this place or something, you know, <laughs> you know, right. And I started thinking, oh, what would be interesting if there was an invention where we stand like in a tube and the whole house is filled with this liquid that cleans everything, everything, yeah. every possession, the floors, the windows, the drapes, but it's this, it's this solution that knows how to clean everything, right? So I, I would, I just called it that night. I called it the house washer. I'm like, Allison, man, we need to get a house washer where we just sit in a tube while everything's cleaned, right? Yeah. I started thinking, oh man, this is a good story idea. Like you put, you put two like jerks in that tube and they got to watch like their lives, like the, the possessions and items of their life, like, like, like spinning around in the tube and being cleaned and like, you know, evidence of wrongdoing that they've done and all these secrets in their house being like cleaned in front of them in this solution. And I, I was like, Oh, this, this is good. So I've been wanting to write that one for geez, for seven years or something like that. It may be even longer, t- like nine years or something. And, um, but yeah, for some reason this time around, I'm like, okay, I'm finally doing it. I'm writing, I'm writing the house washer. Yeah. When you're doing some of these stories and books, do you, do you have like a process for research when you're like, well, what could this make sense? Or if you're like, in a certain location or anything like that, do you have to like sit back and do research or do you just kind of make it up as you make it up as you go? Or what's your process? on? I'm I'm like, that's like my laziest department, man. Like, (laughs) I don't like, no, I don't do anything. Like Allison, Allison's probably like, what? Because Allison's an artist and she's more of like a, a a realist, like Mm -hmm. a realism. And, or she does many things, but when she paints, it's typically more like realism. And I can just imagine her like, what is this? All he's got to do is look up some shit, you know? But she <laughs> she helped me with Black Man Wheel. She was like looking up info about the desert and stuff. She's helped me with topics before because I'm just, I'm kind of a, I'm kind of an impatient artist, you know, an impatient writer. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 okay, well, who cares? It's a desert. What does it matter? You know, and then she's like, wait, hold on, hold on. You know, like, okay, okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, you might get that desert nomad that reads and goes, this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> that guy that's drinking his own pee while he's reading. <laughs> uh, no, you know, I don't. Um, that's probably the weakest part of if writing is a sport, that's the weakest part of my game is research. Yeah. What is the editing process like for some of these when you do a, 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 a one of the books like this that has multiple stories? Do you just send them all together as one to them or kind of as you go off to your editor or what is the process on that? That's a great question. Um, all at once in this case, because again, it was being presented as a collection, right? Um, but if that is interesting. I do wonder, huh? Because I can imagine a scenario where you send the first and then you tell her what you have in mind for the next one. And, and then maybe after two or three, she's like, oh, do you have something like this to shake it up? You know, I could imagine a more collaborative sort of endeavor in that way. And I, and I love my editor, Trisha's great. Um, but no, this was just center the whole thing. Yeah. What about uh, audiobook narration? Do you do you deal a lot with your audiobook narrators or any of that kind of stuff? We got a lot of. I'm an audiobook person. A lot of our people are audiobook people. Um, do you do you have a lot of interaction with your audiobook narrators or anything of that sort? Um, no, 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 no. my dog is uh, coming at. No, no, you want to say hi here? Yeah, dog goes. Come up here. Come up here. Come <laughs> sit. Down. Let's stay down there. Okay. Um, no. Typically, I'll be sent like a list, like. What do you think? Who do you think is best for this? You know, which is a hard decision like for me to make for a number of reasons. Number one, I don't listen to many audio or audiobooks really at all. I'm almost always like the hard copy in my hand kind of guy. Yeah. Allison listens to a ton of audiobooks. So I'll ask her, you know, I'll be like, hey, what do you think for this and stuff? But even then you only get like this little sample, you know? And so it's like, it's almost like you, and they all sound good. Like yeah. they're all good. And you're kind of like, what am I going to pick one and say no to the other? So some, but they still run it by you, which they should, because it's your book and everything. But there's a side of me that's almost like, I would almost prefer that they just chose and did it because it feels odd to, to make any decision about that. Because again, the sample sizes are so small. You'll read like, I mean, I guess you could go listen to them, but, but it's not them doing your book, right? You don't know until they do it, right? Right. So, so I don't have very much to do with that. But every now and then I have recommended, like there's a, um, this fella, Dan John Miller in the Detroit area, I recommended he do Unbury Carol, and he did. Uh, Ashley Lawrence, the star of Hellraiser, does two of the stories in Spin of Black Yarn. Okay. And I, um, her and I have a, a friendship, and I, like, contacted um, Del Rey and said, hey, would, could Ashley do this, you know? So I've been involved, but not really. Okay. And one day I would love to... Um, one day I would love to do one myself for sure. Yeah, that was going to be my next question was, A, uh, are there multiple, in Spin a Black Yard, are there mul multiple readers for the audiobook, or whether you knew that or not? And then B, were you planning on, you know, being a singer, songwriter, performer, if you ever had an inkling to want to read one of your own books or read somebody else's for that matter? It, there's a couple that f would feel weird if someone else did it. You know, that thousand pager, I feel like I should absolutely do it. Well, no, I guess I could hear someone else doing that. But I wrote a not one of the books is a nonfiction book. It's like an account of one amazing night that Allison and I had. Obviously, I got to read that one. Like, stuff yeah. like that. Like, it's talking about me and Allison and whatever. There's a couple along the way where I'm like, Josh, you should do this one. But, it, but again, it's very rare. Yeah. All right. Well, for those that are listening, August 15th, I believe, is the release date for Spin a Black Yarn, correct? Definitely, gonna, yes. definitely going to have to get that, everyone. If you're if you're out there, you know, I was, I totally didn't ask. There's a new spinoff movie, uh, the Barcelona Bird Box Barcelona. Uh, are, how much do you have a hand in that? I keep it's seeing like advertisements for it. Do you have not? They they just take it and spin off on its own. Yeah, but but I mean, to me, that's awesome. Yeah, like. You know, yeah, it's like, let somebody else play in the sandbox. If it's good, great. If it's not, oh, like, who cares? Like, um, you know, so I'll get messages from people. You better be getting royalties. Yeah, I got paid for it, of yeah, course. Right. It's a spinoff of Bird Box, and Bird Box is, is mine, you know? So, of course, blah, blah, blah. But it's like, how do I explain it? I think it's just thrilling, like, to not, like, I have no idea what the story is they're going to go with. I have no idea what script that, you know, 
And then to just see what they came up with is like, dude, it's awesome. It's like somebody playing in a world you created. Yeah, for sure. And you mentioned earlier, I'm bouncing around a little bit kind of here. You mentioned earlier about your production group. Is that the same group that put together the documentary that I saw? I think I saw it was called Quilt of Delirium. No, 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 no. That that was that was before then. That was, man, that was so fun. That was a friend in the Detroit area, Scott Allen, uh, put that together and directed that and edited that and all that. And that was that was an amazing time because that was before Bird Box the movie came out, mm -hmm. where the book had come out. And I think we were I was a couple books deep into into publishing, maybe a few or something. And that was an amazing experience because that dude was great. Did you watch that? It's amazing. I saw I saw some clips of it uh, this weekend, and I yeah, was like, God, I got to sit down right? and finish watching this because this is I just I, the, yeah. I have the feel of it. There was a feel to it that I was like, this is just so um, it just pulls you in. And I thought it was great. Those that are listening, Quilt of Delirium. It's 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 really cool. You can find it on YouTube. I it's not it's not super long. Yeah, you can find it on YouTube. And and oh man, I freaking love that thing. And I also just love that like. You know, I'm sure you have this too, where either you and a friend or you and a colleague said, we should do it sometime, but then you actually do. And it's like the best feeling in the world yeah. because you didn't just say at the bar or something like, oh, we should do something. No, you actually did it. Yeah. And and Scott and I will always have that, you know, and Allison and it was, it was great. Yeah. That's great. That's great. All right. So you... Uh, you mentioned that I asked you earlier about some upcoming events. Usually you do some sort of event for a, for a release and you're not quite sure, but you want to tell us about those events that you do and maybe talk, talk a little bit about some of the ones you've done in the past. Cause that, they, they, it just sounds super fun. Man. So, you know, it's probably because of being in the band and everything, but the idea of me just standing on a podium reading, well, I guess maybe that could be good. I don't know, but it, it seems like I'm surrounded by like all these like amazing people. Why not? We can make these more interesting than me just standing at a podium. And maybe maybe that's all people want to see. I don't know. But so typically I'll play like, you know, uh, the, what's the right phrase? Like synthesizer or keyboard, like scary music and this kind of thing. While well, either Allison acts out the part and me and my friend Christy and maybe narrate. And Allison's already made like props for it. So So don't think of it quite as like a play. We're still like reading from the book and following the book to a T and whatever, or mostly, but it is a theatrical reading. So music, props, costumes, you know, actors, you know, more like performing that performance, that kind of thing. So inspection, you know, we did that one in the chapel of the Masonic temple and, and I'm very Carol. We did in this like awesome, like bar, uh, bird box was in a bar and the whole audience was blindfolded. Oh, wow. um, while I was playing, I was playing the organ and Allison was, you know, playing the role of Mallory. And, um, I mean, on and on these go, Oh, uh, Daphne was in a gymnasium. That was amazing in a high school gymnasium. And I, and the crowd was like, you know, in the bleachers, it was awesome. And spin a black yarn due to like circumstances happening right now, a family, uh, emergency sort of thing. We just haven't, we haven't been able to give that like it's due uh, meaning a theatrical reading, but okay. It doesn't have to be the night the book comes out. Yeah. We can do it a month later. We can do it. Four, we can do it a year later. Right. So it's okay. Uh, it's okay. Like, okay, we're not going to have something like that. The night it comes out. Fine. I'll do something the night it comes out, which is August 15th. Um, but then yeah, we'll get, we will do something as soon after as we can. Can people find the, the, the previous ones where they recorded and put online anywhere? No. They're just like, if no, you're there, no. you got to see it. Yeah, but that's not even like so intentional on my part. Like, but it has been like that. Like, I was talking to a great friend at one point. Like, maybe he could film it in a real way, you yeah. know? Yeah. Like with lighting. And then we were saying if we do that, we should probably like film it the night before the reading so that it's a controlled environment. And yeah. we can, you know, if he wanted me to take something again or, or just little things, maybe. <laughs> but we haven't done that yet. And all those amazing settings I just told you about, like we probably should have. There's amazing photos from all of them. Okay. Like really good photos. Because Gary uh, Malerba, who's in the in the in the troupe, in the group, he's a great photographer. And so we have some incredible photos from like those readings. Your band is the high strung, correct? 
Yeah, no problem. By the way, for those of you watching live, stick around. Go ahead and throw your questions up in the chat. Throw your questions in the chat, and we'll get to them during the live stream Q&A here just in a bit. So uh, go ahead and ask your questions for Josh. We'll get to them, and we'll ask them all here in a bit. Or if you have things you just wanted to say, feel free to do so. Hi, everybody. I'm back. Welcome back. The dogs erupted. <laughs> so your band's name is The High Strung, correct? Yep. Do they, is there a website? Where can people find that stuff? You know, we might as well plug it yeah, while we're here. I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's on everything like Spotify and, mm -hmm. and you can find things on YouTube and, and whatever. I don't, I don't know that we have like a, maybe we had a website at some time and maybe it's still active. I don't I actually don't even really know. Okay. Sounds good. Well, people can go and check it out. Just Google search it. The high strung. It's uh, it's, you know, I, I favored it this weekend. I was just like, nope, we're just going to add that to our list. So. <laughs> Thank you um, for that. But your regular website is joshmallerman.com, correct? Mm -hmm. Twitter, at Josh Mallerman. We're going to see a trend here. At Josh Mallerman on Twitter, or X, I guess it's X now. I don't know if we're supposed to still call it Twitter. No, don't um, even say that. I have no don't idea what we're supposed to call no. it anymore. <laughs> Facebook, backslash Josh Mallerman. Instagram, at Josh Mallerman. All of the places are Josh Mallerman. So... I appreciate you being here. Stick around, everybody, for the live stream Q&A. We're going to ask some questions here in just a moment, and then we'll uh, let Josh go along his way. But first, I want to tell you about coming up. Live on August 14th, Justin Leslie returns. Urban fantasy author of the popular Max Abaddon series and post-apocalyptic zombie series, The Sinking Man, returns to talk about his new books as well as his new Descending World series and his project with his author friend, Hunter Blaine, who we've also had on the show. So that's going to be available for download August 15th against live August 14th. We're also going to be having author D.L. Sawyer is going to be joining us on August 28th. And the modern voice of Scooby-Doo, Scott Innes, is going to be joining us as well on September 11th. So follow, subscribe, rate, review, push all the buttons, all of the buttons to help all of our guests. It helps us and helps them. So thank you so much for being here. And thank you for listening to Epic Realms.